Hello everyone, welcome to a week of Linux news for the 30th of April 2017. I'm going to start with a follow-up to last week's story where I mentioned about the new release of KDE Apps, version 1704. And one of the mentions was about KDE Live, how much more stable it was, and how it gained a couple of new features. Well I have to say, who the bloody hell did the testing on it, because it was one of the worst releases of KDE Live I've actually tried. You see on the tracks here you have these transition effects, so you can overlay one image to another. Kind of like how you're seeing in this video with the video overlaid onto a static background. Well trying to move, add, resize, or do anything with that effect caused KDN Live to crash immediately. Great, well done. So I had to roll back the version because I literally could not make a single video with it. There's been a new release of Plasma 5.9.5. .5. Nothing too much with this release, it's mostly bug fixes and translation updates. Although there is one new feature that the plastic window decoration now supports the global menu. I have to admit this was something that caught me out, that the global menu only worked on the breeze theme. Well, now you have two themes to choose from to use the global menu. Sorry, not the global menu, but the application menu you could add to the application title bar. I wonder when it will appear on more of the themes, or is it a case that the themes have to be updated to allow the application menu to appear there? From FossMint, you can now install the latest Budgie 10.3 desktop in Ubuntu 17.04. And they've provided some installed instructions quite a way down the page after somebody mentions about the features. So it's a case of adding the backports repository. 17.04 has <laughs> yeah, only been out for a couple of weeks or so, and already we have a backports repository to bring in a newer desktop. Support for Ubuntu 12.04 has now officially ended. Its final day was on the 28th of April. So if you're still using the distribution, your options are now to upgrade to the long-term support release of 1404, and then you could go onwards to 1604. Or you could spend a few thousand dollars and purchase the extended security maintenance, which I'm sure is fine if you're a business, but for an individual, yeah, that's going to be unaffordable. If you're still using Ubuntu 1204, it will continue to work. You're just now running at risk, as any new security vulnerabilities will not be patched. From Softpedia, Ubuntu 17.10 will not ship with Upstart and CG Manager as Unity 8 is being dropped. It turns out Unity 8 is heavily dependent on Upstart, so it will not be possible to install on Ubuntu 17.10. So I wonder how the forks are going to deal with that. I suppose Y units will have to work out some method of getting everything across to System D. I was a little bit surprised at the reasoning, so Upstart ongoing maintenance in the archive is not cost free as their sources and test suites must be continually maintained and updated for the toolchain and kernel updates. Whilst both will be supported for the long-term support release and extended support maintenance timelines, I do not wish to ship it in Artful, said Dimitri John Ledkoff, software engineer at Canonical. I take it that the packages are not maintained by Debian. I wonder if the staff reductions in Canonical mean that they're just going to cut things out that are not necessary to the ongoing support of Ubuntu with its main desktop of GNOME. From gaming on Linux, Linux gamers on Arch may want to hold off updating due to OpenSSL breaking some games. Yulf has written, It seems on Arch Update Day has broken a few games, since Feral Interactive titles, as well as Civilization VI from Aspire Media, no longer run. It's apparently an issue with the Arch update of OpenSSL. I sadly updated without knowing there was an issue, so certain games are now broken for me. And there's a list of titles that will not run. There is a workaround to install lib OpenSSL 1 compat and then modify the launch options for the game. It looks like a fatal problem of being on the bleeding edge. From the register, Samsung Smart TV is pawnable over Wi Fi Direct, says Pentester. A security researcher is complaining that Samsung isn't making a serious response to vulnerabilities in its smart TVs. The bug discovered by Pentest outfit Nessuso concerns the television's implementation of Wi-Fi Direct authorization. An attacker only needs to sniff out the MAC address of a trusted device to connect to the TV. From there they can potentially enjoy a jump-off point onto the target's network. Nessuso says it's published its discovery at full disclosure because Samsung doesn't consider it a security risk. The smart TVs have a convenience feature so users don't have to authenticate every time they turn the TV on. Since MAC addresses are easily sniffed over Wi-Fi and can be spoofed, an attacker can impersonate the trusted device and gain full access to the TV's features, including screen mirroring and remote control. Ha! That could be open to abuse. 
Wi-Fi Direct is enabled by default on TVs and switched on each time the TV is powered up, meaning a user would have to turn it off after each time it's powered on. In some ways I can appreciate that being a lower risk attack, because you have to be in range of a target network. The question is the attacking skill of anyone who lives around you. There's quite a long article here about the security investigation done onto a home email server called NoMX. I'm going to read through some of it. So the device costs 199 US dollars and comes boxed up looking like that. So, so, so it is only a small box measuring five and a half inches by five and a half inches. Comes with a micro USB port on the side, looks very crudely cut into the box, and has an Ethernet port just around the corner. You know, some of this style is starting to look very familiar. And it has a MAC address labelled there with B827 and EB. Hmm, where have I seen that before? I can see that going through the researcher's mind, and uh, I started noticing it myself, but let's scroll down a bit further, and you can see it is a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> so they've just made a custom box for a Raspberry Pi that uh, seems to be a bit larger than it needed to be, and they're charging $200 for that. What is the price of a Raspberry Pi in America? Is that uh, it's around $40, I think? And let's say, well, let's be generous and say that lot costs what, between $10 to $20. Let's go for the higher amount, $20. So all in all, you've got a $60 device here. What's your other $140 being spent on? Well, you're getting a little bit of custom software here to help you set up your mail server. And it also contains some pre-installed applications which are quite horrendously out of date. But it's based on Raspbian, so that should contain the latest updates. Unless I'm missing a point, but they were, this was something the researcher mentioned that a lot of the software is out of date horrendously vulnerable to cross-site scripting attacks. There's an administration page and you can set up a password on it. And he mentions a bit about how the password is stored. So it's stored as a randomized MD5 salt that's SHA1 with a SHA1 password. Hmm, if only there was a secure method of generating a password hash in PHP. Hmm, oh well, guess we'll never know. And you can have a minimum password length of five characters. Well done, that's going to be super secure. The reasoning behind this device is meant to be because so many email companies have been hacked. Very true, but uh, I don't think it's necessarily the answer to go running your own device. Not to say there is nothing wrong with running your own device. Um, and you can certainly run an email server from a Raspberry Pi. In fact, I suspect there are better setups for this. And you don't really need a device that costs $200. I'll leave a link to this article in the video description, and you can check it out yourself. For the narcissistic, selfie-loving generation, Amazon are selling a new Echo device which can take photos. At $200, and it's not available in the United Kingdom yet. So there's this video advert about it, but I don't know whether I can actually play that on my channel, so I'll just have to leave a static image here and it shows a picture that has been just been taken from the device. I noticed it seems to be aimed at women. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. You can ask the Echo device to take photos, videos, and you can get an opinion on what outfit suits you best. Yeah, I can just imagine me trying to use that. Hmm. Alexa, which of the half a dozen hoodies I own should I wear today? Oh, how about the one that's not stinking, festering, and needs to be washed? Yeah, that'll do. Hmm, perhaps I'm not the target market for this device. Another article from Gaming on Linux, OpenLara, an impressive open source engine for the classic Tomb Raider, has a WebGL demo. So if you're a teenager in the 1990s, you probably have uh, fond memories of the old Tomb Raider games. Yes, I think there was the sex cells in games back then. Although the box art certainly looked a lot better than the game. We can take a quick look at the browser playable demo, and you'll notice it's a case of more polygons needed. <laughs> Yeah, great physique there. <laughs> well, I think this'll do. I'm done. And finally, for this week's stupid news, from the register, man nicked trying to save beer from burning building. A South Dakotan man was cuffed after he repeatedly barged past police and firefighters that were trying to deal with a blaze in his apartment block so he could re-enter and rescue his most precious possession, beer. Michael Castell was nicked on the 27th of March when he re-emerged from the property in Sioux Falls, 
clutching two cans of Bud Ice Premium, all while emergency services treated other local residents. <laughs> Honestly, Bud Ice. And on that note, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you later. <laughs>